malaria cases. Um, let's go to the first slide. Uh, what this map is trying to show us is uh, how we've been progressing since about 2009. Uh, we had a malaria indicator survey in 2009. Around that time, the malaria prevalence was uh, about 42%, meaning that uh, every other time you found 100 people, 42 who are carrying malaria parasites. Uh, but uh, given uh, the different interventions we've been doing, like the LLIN campaigns, the indoor residual spraying, the improved malaria case management, we've been progressing re uh, reducing uh, our population level parastemia, and this has been the progress uh, because by 2014, uh, you note that the the, the color the colors of the map changed because then the prevalence reduced to about 19 percent and uh and uh by 2018 the malaria prevalence further reduced to, uh, to 9.1 percent however uh from around 2018 uh we started noting that um we are beginning to get new, clin uh, new, new clinical scenarios. Um, uh, and uh, what the trend, the disease trend changed from uh, mainly affecting the children under five to affecting older age groups. And, uh, and uh, as a result, we also noted that the number, we were beginning to lose gains for where we had successfully reduced uh, the incidence and malaria mortality. Next slide. Um, and then clearly, uh, after 20, uh, 2017, there was further, further plateauing, but eventually there was a stagnation. And then this was uh, followed by protect, pro protracted outbreaks for about 18 months in several districts. And that was from around uh, 2019, April. And, uh, and this got worse from around September 2021. And uh, we've had a number of infrequent malaria outbreaks uh, from around 2015 to 2016, um, mainly because we we're having a bit of medicines failure. We had a rebound of cases following the withdrawal of indoor residual spraying. Can we go back in, uh, in 2015, 2016 in the districts of Acholi and, and Lango? And in 2019, we, we had outbreaks happening in about 68 districts. Uh, next slide. Um, this graph here is trying to show us how we've been progressing. It's, it sort of speaks to the previous slides. You note that around 2014, uh, then the trend of cases was, uh, was, uh, was uh, a bit lower. And uh, by 2017, um, um, it went a bit higher, but around that time we distributed nets. And then in 2018, you note that the cases went a bit uh, lower down. But at the end of 20, like I said, September, um, at the end of 2019, we begin to notice that the cases go up. Then around 2020, here when we give uh, when we give mosquito nets. Uh, the cases go down a bit. Let me go back a bit as I do the CASA. Here, the cases were low. Um, we, they go lower down here around 2015. And then uh, we go on to note them going up. 2017, we do a mosquito net campaign. They come down a bit. Then they go up. Um, and then now here we do a number. We scale up interventions around 2018. They come down a bit. Uh, they rise again around 2019 and towards here they rise and rise further. Then we do another campaign here uh, in 2020, mosquito net campaign. They go down and uh, they go up again. And now you notice that we haven't really gone back down from around 2020. We are in and out. We are getting, uh, we're getting epidemics, you note here. We 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 have a we have a, we have a rise in cases. Then it goes down a bit. Uh, that's around 2021, and then they go up again. Now in a, in a, towards the end of 2022, starting 2023, you see that the cases go up again, and uh, it's around 2022 here that a malaria epidemic was declared. 
by the Strategic Committee of Ministry of Health. Next slide. So clearly, um, here we're looking at uh, the number of cases per thousand, and we are looking also at the number of admissions, and we are looking at reported deaths per 100,000. Clearly, you can see that in 2017, um, um, we, around July, we had a rise. Then we start the, the campaign and uh, the nets are distributed and uh, I will get a bit of a rise around uh, July 2018, because uh, of course for July it's expected because of the rains. And now here we again have a drop after the nets have been distributed. And then, uh, and then uh, we, have other, we have other interventions at community level, mainly by SUMA and MAPD that uh, significantly improved access to treatment and significantly because these people were doing community artists and treat uh, where people would be timely treated and the cases would significantly come down. Then 2019, the cases go back up and then you see that 2020 they drop and um, and uh, and then they go up a bit. Then uh, around here they drop because uh, uh, because we have better case management. Because uh, around 2020 here uh, there was improvement in commodity availability, and uh, we scaled up ICCM. So the cases here uh, dropped a bit. Uh, uh, this around this time here, that's around 21. Now again, from that time, you see that uh, uh, we have a peak around June 2022, and in October, uh, they declare a malaria epidemic. Uh, you note that the, the, the graph for malaria admission uh, also follows closely when there is a rise, there is a, there is a, there is, um, there is a rise as well. And when there's a drop, there's a drop. When there's a rise in admission, in uh, the, the num total number of cases, you also have a rise in the admissions. So they move closely. Uh, but uh, um, here, when you, you see that there's better case management, there's, uh, there's ICCM coming in. You see that uh, the curve for admissions comes down a bit because I think most of them access treatment on time and they don't come in as severe malaria, but generally the two graphs are moving together. Now for deaths, uh, these are, please note that these are facility-based, um, these are fa facility-based deaths. And uh, you'll be alarmed that the cases are, are lower well, uh, to some extent, we attribute it to improved severe malaria management for those that manage to reach the facility. Uh, but um, uh, one one important thing to note with the deaths is that this is uh, less of the of the deaths that happen in community. We well know that uh, a number of deaths happen in the community. That's why re this really happened. This really appears very flat. And one of the things we're working on as malaria control program is to try and uh, see that we capture community deaths and they're included in our reports. Probably we may be having a bigger picture than this. Uh, let's see the next graph, please. Uh, so we try to show here the weekly case trends uh, of 2021 to April 2023. Uh, you note that uh, clearly the cases have been increasing. Um, uh, and only uh, it's uh, even when they come down, they quickly go back up. Uh, December 2022, yes, uh, you note that was a bit of drop, but also had issues with the reporting rates. And then uh, around uh, around uh, the last weeks, you see that the cases go up again. And uh, and uh, and at the beginning of 2022, the cases ra cases go up again, and then they drop. So generally, you can see that they, we've had a, a high case load for quite some time. And uh, and uh, following that. We uh, we presented this kind of picture to the to the to the strategic committee of Ministry of Health, and having looked at various reports that were coming through, they declared the malaria epidemic in October 2022. Next slide. So just to summarize, um, onset of this outbreak uh, was uh, mainly 2021. Since then, over 45 districts have been experiencing malaria outbreaks. 
uh, by February 2022, 20 out of 136 districts were reported as being in epidemic mode. And uh, we've of course had seasonal down, down, downward trends in, uh, in case in some situations, as you saw in the graphs following a dry spell, but as rains increase, uh, we also note an increase in cases. Um, we've experienced a number of protracted diffuse and mild district outbreaks. Uh, mainly, uh, surprisingly, uh, these have been mainly happening in uh, either current or former indoor residual spraying districts and uh, districts in the refugee uh, setting. And whereas it's known that transmission is by vectors, we also note that the intra-district stroke subcounted drivers and the contextual interplay of transmission dynamics are poorly understood. For some of us who want to do research, like currently we're really looking for someone to really make us understand uh, the drivers of malaria transmission uh, in Karamoja region. So for, for some of us who want to do research, this bullet is very, very important. And, uh, and I am very sure you can easily find funding if you so want to do it. Like clearly, we want to understand what are the intra-district, intra-sub-county drivers and contextual interplays of transmission. Um, and, uh, and why do they happen? Why are they happening like that? And why in certain areas? This is something we really would want to understand. But we also note the heterogeneity in the burden of disease and the transmission dynamics in each of the regions and districts and sub-counties. Key here to note is that, is that the burden of disease, the burden of malaria is heterogeneous in the region and in the districts and also in the sub-counties. So you, what you may get in one parish may be different from what you get in another parish within the same sub-county. And what you get in a certain sub-county may be different in what you get uh, in another sub-county in as much as you're dealing with the, city, with the same district. And what you get in a given district may differ from what is in another district, but they are all located in the same region. So they are, they are there, and, and this is why when you're analyzing issues of malaria, the malaria situation, you need to dive deeper into the different contextual issues for the different geographical locations or uh, geographical zones. So um, we went ahead to do mapping, uh, risk mapping and categorization. We started by doing a desk review uh, using DHIS2 data to inform risk cat categorization and planning for the response intervention packages. Um, the proposed response has been disaggregated below the district level up to sub-county level. So this particular response plan that I'll share later, you realize and note that uh, we have actually uh, uh, not focused only at the district or the region, but we've dived deeper to also look at, uh, uh, to also uh, subcategorize the district into different zones in terms of sub-counties. So um, uh, you'll find that we classified, say, given district into high, moderate, and low transmission zones based on composite indicator uh, that was pa parameterized by the following uh, uh, parameters or indicators. One, the test positivity rate, the incidence per 1,000 per year, malaria in pregnancy cases, suspected malaria cases. So we used these parameters to categorize uh, um, maybe a given district into high, moderate, low transmission. So you'll find that if we come to like Ginger, we will further look at the sub-counties and see which are the high transmission sub-counties in this district and which are the low transmission sub Because then the intervention packages for each is uh, differs, we shall see. So eventually, uh, the top 33, we, we eventually realized that the top 33% districts with the highest weights formed the highest burden sub counties. Um, and then the lowest 33.3 uh, formed the low burden sub counties. And then, so when we get into a district, you find that where we classified as high burden, the interventions are different from what we, uh, we classify as low burden. So this is in an attempt to make sure that we are not wasteful and we are appropriately uh, tailoring interventions. Uh, go on, please. At the time we started, that was around, uh, um, this is uh, this is the end of April, but at the time we started, that was around, uh, around uh, February. This was the picture. 
The districts you see in red are the response districts, and these are the districts where we're having uh, epidemics. Those in yellow are in alert. But subsequently in the map, you'll see, uh, you'll see that we have also included districts where we are watching. So here at that time, uh, we noted that uh, um, we had uh, the districts that were currently doing IRS like Tororo, Butaledia, Butebo, Budaka, Palisa, Chibuku, Namutumba, and Bujiri. Clearly here in the map, you can see them as uh, they were all in epidemic mode. And then we also had former IRS like Aleptong, Amolata, Serere. Uh, they were also experiencing epidemics at that time, so uh, an epidemic at that time. Then uh, also we noted that the refugee hosting districts like Hisinjiro, Chikube, Bundibujo, Kamwenge, they were also experiencing malaria epidemics. Um, um, and uh, it's important to note that actually, the IRS districts have had a protracted, uh, a more than a more than a protracted epidemic, and the refugee areas uh, um, experience occasional outbreaks. So the key question is here, and I know you're going to ask, why the IRS district? What happened? What went wrong? Um, how come we are having epidemics in uh, in uh, uh, in districts where we are having a highly impactful intervention like indoor residual spring? Then what happens to the refugee districts? What exactly happens? Is there is there omission at some level? As these guys come in and they come in with malaria parasites and transmit, and they are not getting treatment on time. Is it the kind of housing? Are they not using the mosquito nets that are given to them? These are the questions we keep asking ourselves. Um, and then two weeks ago is what we are going to see in the next map. Let's have a look at the next map. What has changed? So here you, you see that we further uh, try to categorize the, the country into a number of zones. Still, we have uh, the ones that have uh, malaria epidemics in red, and this is where we are targeting the response. Uh, you will see that uh, clearly, we still have districts like, um, um, we still have districts like um, Butebo, we still have districts like Namutumba, we still have uh, most of these districts. Then we have those that are on alert, uh, clearly, you're seeing uh, um, <clears throat> you're seeing the districts in yellow as being in alert, and then there are those that we are watching, uh, like uh, Lamohia, and then uh, we have a number of Karamoja districts. But in Karamoja, this picture is expected uh, because uh, you know that we are doing seasonal malaria chemo prevention in Kala Karamoja. And, uh, and normally we start in May because that is the time the rains are heavy and most of the transmission is happening. But so immediately, I think at the end of April, this kind of picture I am starts out or towards April. And uh, we're actually thinking, can we even start our seasonal malaria chemo prevention in April and probably end a little earlier, like in August? These are things we are discussing. Because you can see clearly then uh, most of the Karamoja districts are, are being watched because the cases are, are increasing. So the ones in green are stable. The stable transmission, they are not worrying, meaning that the, the, the levels of uh, the, 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 the number of malaria and pregnancy cases here are less, the incidence is, uh, is uh, less, the, 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 the test positivity rate is lower. So for these districts, um, next slide. So this is the picture as of two weeks ago. So um, as a result of that, um, we realized that uh, as a, a, a malaria control program, we couldn't effectively respond to the malaria outbreaks and epidemics, uh, given that the, now the districts were more. And uh, we also uh, knew that uh, uh, the country has successfully responded to other emergencies like COVID-19 and the Ebola virus disease uh, through the incident management system. So um, having declared a malaria epidemic in October, given those parameters, um, a team of us were trained uh, for the for the incident management system so that the country could uh, could actually adapt the incident management system. And what was the purpose and objectives for adapting this? Uh, we basically wanted to guide and ensure uh, timely, consistent, and coordinated response activities to interrupt transmission and control malaria epidemics in Uganda. 
So that's why we are going incident management system. Because uh, we realize that as a program, um, you can't coordinate all districts. You can't, uh, you can't make sure that commodities arrive on time. You can't move resources on time. You can't command, um, you can't, you can't, uh, you can't um, uh, get funds very quickly. So, uh, well, so we're now operating under the incident management system in order to achieve the following objectives. One, we want to strengthen leadership stewardship, coordination of the malaria outbreak response in the high burden districts. Number two, we want to strengthen response capacity at all levels, including communities on malaria epidemic response. We want to strengthen the response. So the key thing here is that uh, in as much as Minister of Health was trained, there are also going to be efforts to uh, train um, high burden regions and eventually to train on incident management on the incident management system, but also train the districts. Then the other thing is that the third objective is that we want to interrupt transmission in the high burden districts. And then we want to strengthen capacity for malaria epidemic test management, including the referral and emergency medical services, blood supply oxygen, and then also the skilling of healthcare workers. Not that they are not skilled, but uh, you know, severe disease care is a little uh, challenging. Um, people need regular drills, they need regular assessment. Some people lose, uh, 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 lose grip on their skills and they need to be consistently uh, supervised and reminded, they need to be doing practice. So these are things we want to achieve by doing uh, by through the uh, incident management system. Uh, can we see the next slide? Can we do the next slide? So uh, in there we have uh, intervention approaches. Uh, we have uh, the interruption of transmission. Uh, we have the optimized care for patients. We want to do behavior modification. We want to do surveillance monitoring and evaluation and then the, the logistics management. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Uh, it's more elaborate. Uh, so um, this is how we are approaching the, the, the this is how we are approaching the, the malaria epidemic response. Um, we have different thematic areas. Uh, and then uh, each of the thematic areas has a purpose. We have a thematic area that uh, whose purpose is to ensure that transmission is interrupted. And in here, the interventions include malaria mass drug administration. Uh, they include indoor residual spraying. They include the provision and use of long lasting insecticide or treated mosquito nets. They include level source management, uh, that is larviciding and environmental hygiene. And when we do malaria mass drug administration, the intended outcome is population parastemia reduction. And for indoor warriors just spraying, we want to reduce the adult vector population. And then for when we do provide nets, we want to prevent contact between the vector and the humans. And then for level source management, we are still aiming at reducing the vector uh, population by killing its, uh, its larvae. Uh, the next uh, th thematic area, uh, the purpose is to reduce morbidity and mortality. Still here, one of the interventions is malaria, mass drug administration. Uh, and here, the intended outcome is to reduce population, uh, population parastemia. Uh, because you know that once you have many people carrying parasites, uh, then you will have a number of people getting infected, and uh, and then they will come in uh, they will come in sick with malaria. Then number two is community case management, under which the, we want to scale up and improve the quality of integrated community case management implementation, because uh, we clearly know that what is compromising the quality of implementation is the stock out of commodities and the and, uh, the, the, the low reporting levels. So we want to streamline this, and uh, uh, we want to also scale up 
uh, because there are some areas that need ICCM and they don't have. Then we also want to uh, cater for the older age group. Meanwhile, before we do, we introduce the community case management. We want to be reaching the older age group now that we've even noted that uh, the trend has changed. We want to uh, to do to 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 reach the older age group by doing community outreaches for malaria testing and treatment. This way, we think that there will be timely access to care and, and timely clearance of parasitemia. Um, the other under here is appropriate equip, equipping and um, and uh, and tooling of frontline health workers. We want to consistently avail malaria case management commodities and supplies. Because we know at times you may have the commodities, but when the supplies for severe disease management are inadequate, like clearly we know blood, oxygen, the 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 other the other the other accessories are like um like uh, like cannulas, uh, dextrose, nomoceline, some of these things are usually not available. And then we also want to make sure that uh, updated guidelines and tools are available. Updated guidelines on patient care in terms of triage, in terms of resuscitation, in terms of uh, nursing care, in terms of patient monitoring, how to discharge a patient. A malaria patient should not just be discharged just like that. It should be a smart discharge that comprises of good health education, that comprises of uh, providing the patient with a net that comprises of, of making sure that this patient is continuing treatment with dihydratomycin and piperaquine, and they are coming back on day seven, day 14, and day 21, and then day 28 for follow-up and assessment. Then on day 28, you're giving them another dose of dihydratomycin in uh, piperaquine as a post-severe malaria treatment, discharge treatment, so that they don't die in the community. And you're telling them to come back for more or two doses. This is uh, these are the guidelines we're talking about. But also when the patient is on the ward, that you they are not their notes are not being written in an exercise book, but they are being written in an admission form. And I mean an ad, and they have an admission chart that has uh, paper for progress notes. It has uh, paper for treatment. It has paper for monitoring uh, the key parameters. Uh, including uh, fluid input and, uh, and urinary output. Um, these are the things we're talking about because these are key limitations to patient care. And this is why some of our patients are actually dying. So here, but the intended outcome is improved quality of care. Another thing we want to do is reinforce use and adherence to the standard guidelines during, during, during malaria case management. And here we want to do mentorship and coaching. We want to do routine clinical care drills. People, we know very well that you could have done resuscitation as maybe um, an intern or when you're doing your postgraduate, but when you come into the facility to work and uh, and it goes on for some time, you lose the skill. I've seen some of my colleagues who are doing uh, who are doing patient resuscitation very excellently, but uh, you get them to uh, to resuscitate a patient, ask them to do a chest compression, you'll be very surprised. You realize that actually with the way they are doing the chest comp compression, they cannot they cannot successfully resuscitate this patient. Someone is asked to do suction for a patient and you clearly see they can't successfully do suction. So we want, uh, we want to be doing this uh, routine assessment and drill so that people don't lose grip on their skill. And then mortality death reviews and case reviews. We shall not only review cases of, uh, of malaria, patients that have died due to malaria, but we need also to be reviewing some of these files, especially for the patients, uh, for some of these patients that, um, that, um, that uh, were near miss, these patients that survived death. There is a lot to learn from this kind of files. What do we do different in order to, to, to help this patient to survive? Of course, there's also support supervision because it is this that looks into some other infrastructure challenges. And all we need at the end of the day is improved quality of clinical care. Next slide. Next slide, please. And uh, this speaks to, uh, to strengthening referrals by bridging the gap in the emergency medical services. We want 
want uh, we want a referral we want a referral system that starts that uh, has clearly defined community linkages uh, with VHTs involved, as in the as in the, the the VHT should have the contact of their of their health facility in charge, and the health facility in charge should have a list of of LC ones and uh, and the VHTs in their catchment area. Uh, we want uh, we want um, we want uh, we want uh, available functional ambulances. We want uh, we want uh, fuel uh, available and allowances for the drivers. We want clear route charts for the available uh, available available ambulances within the region and we want uh, we want uh, we want uh, to clearly have uh, the numbers of some of, the, of these ambulances so that whenever we have a situation where a patient should be referred there is timely uh, initiation of care and timely initiation of referrals and timely care for severe malaria cases so that these people are not dying the other thing here we want to do is uh, of course, I forgot that bullet, but uh, we know that the private sector is very key in this. So we need to collaborate with the private sector because they are usually a rate limiting factor when it comes to timely referral of patients. Uh, then the third thematic area here, uh, the purpose is to uh, to do risk and behavior change communication. Um, and here the intervention is uh, share up to date data driven and context specific information on the malaria burden, risk factors, dangers and complications of malaria and prevention practices. We really need this. And here we want to make sure that there's enhanced health seeking behavior for early testing and treatment. And uh, uh, thematic area number four is prompt prediction and detection of cases and alerts. And uh, here, what we want we want to do the following: one and avail, uh, one is to avail and functionalize laboratory services. The other is to provide an organized response surveillance, monitoring, and evaluate uh, evaluation uh, system. And the intended outcome here is to uh, to have an improved accurate documentation of malaria cases and complications. Uh, members, this bullet of this outcome is very important. Currently we can't effectively quantify supplies for severe malaria care because we don't know, we, well, it's obvious that severe anemia could be the common complication of malaria, but what follows? We can't clearly uh, quantify which, which complications will come mostly so that we can uh, quantify adequately and uh, so that we can, uh, we can focus a lot on giving people skill in managing some of these complications that are more common than others. And then we will also want to still improve uh, a documentation and reporting of malaria cases and complications. And one of the things that have been done by this uh, thematic area is to actually come up with uh, a tool that tries to capture uh, the, the different complications of, uh, of severe malaria. Then logistics and supply chain uh, management thematic area, mainly the purpose here is to make sure that we consistently have logistics and supplies available. And so they started by identifying the list of required commodities and supplies, and uh, they are currently quantifying and forecasting need. And, um, and then I think they, they, they develop, uh, they've already developed a, procurement plan. I know teams are going down to do micro planning, I think starting next week. And uh, when they come back with these reports, they will, uh, they will uh, then we shall harmonize what we have because you know, by micro planning, we get, we want to get uh, the district context because right now what we have is based on the data that we are analyzing from Minister of Health. And that is what we've used to develop this procurement plan. But after the teams come back from the micro planning activities and have gotten the district picture and the, and the sub count or, uh, or the sub county picture, then we shall harmonize the two to make sure that we are we are planning ap uh, appropriately. And the purpose, the intended outcome here is that we want to monitor stock and respond in real time so that we consistently have stock available. Next slide. Next slide, please. So um so like I was mentioning earlier, the incident management system for the malaria outbreak response, um, um, one was activated uh, by the strategic committee 
and uh, the strategic committee directed that uh, um, that uh, that uh, the incident management system manages the outbreak and not the program, and the program can only give technical support. And uh, on top of that, they can continue doing the other routine activities. They went on to train Minister of Health, and uh, and uh, and uh, this training was done by World Health Organization, and they targeted members from National Malaria Control division okay i'll put program incident management team there's already a team um the esd and eoc emergency operations center uh then the imt was activated by tasking and assigning uh, an incident commander we all know dr kano chobe kano chobe is the incident commander again and the deputy incident commander is uh, a tech kajirita and then a response plan was uh, was developed so all i'm presenting here is what is in that response plan so um basically um um uh, the, the the incident management system has the following pillars there's the coordination pillar and this is what should be the replica at lower level the surveillance laboratory case management that has emergency medical services strategic information research and innovation this is the theory pillar the risk communication and social behavior uh, mobilization and community engagement these are combined but normally they want to be separate risk communication and social mobilization wants to be different from community engagement and social protection then we have vector control and environmental health we have logistics and then we have continuity of routine malaria services, including the private sector. So these are the pillars in this response plan. And this is what we expect to be replicated. If the above objectives that I mentioned are supposed to be, uh, uh, are to be achieved. Next slide. So this is the incident management team organogram. Click clearly at the strategic level, we have the chair who is the honorable, uh, Minister of Health. This committee sits every Tuesday between uh, 12 and 2, and uh, they give us direction. And then uh, below it, we have a national task force, the NTF, that is chaired by the Director General of Health Services. And until this pass something, we don't take action. Then we have uh, the Scientific Advisory Committee. Um, we already have one. It's chaired by Professor Kamia. Uh, these ones are supposed to uh, pro provide scientific advisory to the National Task Force and also the Strategic Committee. Then after that, down there, we have the IMT uh, uh, that is led by the Incident Commander Kano Chove. And then uh, on this other side, we have Cyber Finance and uh, Admin. And uh, alongside it, we have continuity of routine malaria activities. And this is where I find your National Malaria Control Division and uh, and then you can see that down here we have the human resource and finance and admin in case we need more health workers like in situations where because like like i think next week but one a team of pediatric nurses is going to be deployed in about 12 districts uh from health i think district hospitals to health center for to support the teams there in severe malaria management then passive case management and uh, maybe scheduled campaign uh, and a continuity of routine malaria. Like, of course, now I'll give you an example. Uh, like, uh, like of course, now ICCA malaria case management, the routine is under as some of those activities that we do as malaria control division. So under the incident management system, we have a number of pillars. We have case management and preventive therapies. Case management here is responsible for health facility-based care. Um, it's responsible for community case management and also private sector case management. And preventive therapies here include the malaria mass drug administration. Uh, so that is that pillar. We have surveillance information management and laboratory. That's another pillar. We have strategic information research and innovation Siri pillar. We have risk communication, um, risk communication. We have community engagement and we have logistics and now unique for malaria unlike other other imts we have the environment environment and vector control why because our ours is driven by a vector 
and the environment is another contributing factor. So it should be very well managed if you control malaria. So under malaria case management, we have sub, we have uh, we have sub pillars. We have clinical management. We have preventive uh, therapy or chemo prevention. Then we have the emergency medical services. All these are sub pillars under the case management and preventive therapies, and they are all very key. Here, you, you will manage morbidity, malaria morbidity, and prevent the occurrence of severe malaria and death. But also, when someone gets severely ill, you manage severe malaria and, and, uh, and prevent death. Preventive therapies for where you're having parasitemia above 70%. Um, in given sub counties, you want to go and do malaria mass drug administration. And so that even when you still have mosquitoes, they have no parasites to pick. So you reduce transmission, you reduce infection, you reduce cases. Emergency medical services will mainly support referral, reach a station of patients, name it. So under this other pillar, we have surveillance, laboratory information management, monitoring, and evaluation. Then Siri, we have uh, strategic information, research and innovation. You saw that you will see somewhere that uh, for us to improve some of our interventions, we shall do a lot of research. Then uh, risk communication will do public awareness. They will inform, they will keep informing the public about what is happening, the burden, uh, what, what are the risks, but then also communicate the preventive measures. Community engagement, communication is one thing, but we need to engage community. We need to be going into community and engaging them to understand that malaria is a problem um, and, and help them understand why malaria is a problem and what they can do them as themselves to make sure that malaria, that like, for example, environmental hygiene, this is something community can do on routine. You just know, you just decide that every month at this time, all tools are down, we are only doing environmental hygiene. Then logistics, um, uh, supplies and buffer stocks, transport, and then also uh, then, um, uh, then environment and vector, into surveillance, indoor residue spraying, long lasting insect and mosquito nets and larviciding. I already spoke to this. So this kind of organogram is what we expect the districts to replicate as they form their district task forces. We should have representation for all these pillars. It's very, very important if we are to coordinate the malaria epidemic response effectively. To me, this is the most important slide. Let's go to the next slide. So um, when you talk about the coordination pillar, what are their roles? They, want, they have to develop, disseminate, train on incident management system guidelines and standard operating procedures. They have to do district risk assessments. They have to activate the district task forces and the national task forces and the sub-county task forces. They have to deploy the, the SAGI teams these side teams can, can include clinical teams, epidemiologists, data lab. Right now, I think for the clinical, they are going to deploy. I think they already also deployed epidemiologists. Um, they have to, to do a coordination meeting and stock stakeholder engagement because you know we need funds. Next slide. Uh, surveillance and lab for surveillance. Uh, we, we are, they are currently reviewing data collection tools and updating them, and uh, soon they should be disseminated. They're supposed to establish a, a, a lot, an alert system for early referral and early detection of cases. They are supposed to do cluster investigations of outbreaks. They are supposed to review epidemic thresholds for alerts, response, and when to disengage. They are supposed to reorient health workers on uh, electronic integrated disease surveillance and response. Uh, they are supposed to um, come up with an alert management system to identify severe cases. You, you had me mention earlier that we really need to be line listing the severe malaria cases and indicating which complications are that we can be able to track which complications are, co are common and from where and support appropriate uh, disposition through the referral pathway, uh, entomological surveillance and uh, identifying level habitats and uh, mapping the level habitats, vector density and species. 
this is very, very important because at times some insecticide does well with some species of, of mosquitoes. Um, at times some interventions may not be appropriate because you're thinking that all your mosquitoes bite inside and rest inside, yet you could be having outdoor biters. For the peri-urban urban, we know that there is a, a new species of mosquito that is very, very unique and very, very complicated. Uh, we also know that different areas have different vectors. Then develop and disseminate uh, uh, reports, situation reports. This is what surveillance is supposed to do. Then for the laboratory, basically, you want to improve the capacity for testing and confirmation of cases. So one of the things they plan to do is uh, a, rapid, uh, a rapid needs assessment for malaria diagnosis in epidemic districts um, so that they make sure that all, all equipment and tools are available uh, or what gaps are they having so that they can be bridged. Uh, the, are microscopes functional? Um, and then um, are the RRDTs enough? How about the testing for, uh, do we have equipment for testing for malaria complications? Then they want to review, update and disseminate lab guidelines and standard operating procedures plus information education materials. They want to rapidly train um, uh, lab response teams, uh, that is TOTs and, uh, and uh, facility-based mentorships. They want to do support supervision. They want to distribute supplies and consumables. They are mentioning them here. Rapid diagnostic tests, the slides, you know that for microscopy, we need slides. Some of them get broken, some of them get scratched. Glucometers are very keen detecting hypoglycemia, which is a common killer in malaria. Uh, Hemocues, uh, we got information that some people are actually rewashing and washing uh, the cuvettes and, uh, and, 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 uh, and reusing them. Gloves. Uh, some uh, it's important that our health workers have gloves and then blood collection sets and blood giving sets. Um, deployment of the lab site. Capacity mobile teams we want to do mobile testing, conduct genomics to determine para parasite etiology, uh, species densities. Um, we want to do uh, PCR, we want to, to, to get to understand their clones, the markers, the deletions. Quite a number of things that uh, happen here when now uh, that we understand when we do genomics. Because one, we know that uh, increasingly we are getting uh, more species uh, increasing in number. Uh, we also know that uh, some parasites are, um, have different clones. So uh, you may, if, uh, if, uh, if your tools are, are not able to pick a certain clone, then you may miss it. And then also we know that uh, some parasites, are, um, we are beginning to get HRP2 deletions. So that's why we want to enter, intensify the genomics. Um, next slide. Under case management, as, uh, um, as soon as yesterday and immediately for where we have uh, moderate to high transmission, especially for moderate to high transmission where test positivity rate is above 70, we don't even need to waste our time going around doing tests. Testing and treatment. Ideally, what we want to go and do is do um, at least, uh, and then uh, and then we also want to be by doing on-site mentorships, uh, by making sure that uh, our guidelines are available, people are trained, but also we want to make sure that uh, we adapt the uh, triadial logarithm that we are using for COVID and contextualize it for malaria and make sure that every patient that gets into the facility is triaged and that triaged those that have severe malaria can be can be picked on time, stabilized, and so that they don't die in the line. Then uh, we also want to make sure that all facilities facilities that manage severe malaria have a clear triage pathway. And then we want to distribute and avail guidelines and job aids. And then we want to screen and uh, treat caregivers of malaria positive clients at health facilities. Then uh, another area we want to really work on is the management of severe malaria cases, because we really want to make sure that we're not losing any patient due to malaria. So we want to make sure clinical supplies are available, um, mainly blood, IV fluids, um, oxygen, um, 
things like uh, recto and IV diazepam, phenobarbitone, uh, all these things that we manage in the, uh, we use in the management of severe malaria, we want them consistently available. But also we want to make sure that medicines for management of uncomplicated malaria are equal available. And we want to make sure that community case management, integrated community case management, VHTs have rectoartisunet, because remember this is the treatment we use for pre-referral uh, of all children under, under five years. Uh, so we want to make sure that the VHTs actually have, um, have a rectal artisanate, and then also the availability of diagnostics. Then we want to train on the management of severe malaria through especially mentorships. That's why we're sending out the pediatric nurses. Um, and then we want to be very sure that all patients of severe malaria uh, receive the post-severe malaria discharge package that includes DP, a mosquito net, and then uh, they have clear messaging on malaria. We want to conduct drills for severe malaria management and we want to functionalize the high dependence units. Uh, fortunately for us under COVID, we are now very sure that all regional referral hospitals um, to some extent have intensive care, but they also have high dependence units. So we want to uh, ride on that infrastructure and make sure that our patients of severe malaria are managed very well. Then at the community level, we want to train health workers to identify, to, we want to train VHTs to identify danger signs so that they refer on time. But also we want to make sure they can give rectatisunet. We want to deploy the test and treat strategy. Uh, still, I uh, want to orient school nurses uh, on malaria case management, want to make guidelines available. Then uh, for strengthening referral, uh, we want to orient emergency uh, medical teams on triage for early detection and response to danger signs. We want to provide emergency care of first point of contacts. We want to deploy the alert system, the emergency medical uh, services protocol. We want to provide ambulance services to facilitate patient referral. We want to improve referral systems, sending advance and, and notice and supporting ambulance system. Um, because uh, you know, uh, this, is, uh, this exists in some areas and, uh, and uh, uh, referral is a key limitation to the movement of severely ill patients. Then we want to do capacity assessment and mapping of trained clinical teams and key partners and then deployment of such, such clinical teams. Like I said, they are already going to deploy uh, pediatric nurses and then identify and train clinical care teams. Uh, next slide. Kindly. Oh, what has happened? We've taken off the slides, yeah. Are you back? Oh, you're not. Let me continue. So um, for vector control, we want to do indoor residue spraying. Uh, for where we have uh, moderate to high transmission, uh, we want to uh, spread, sp uh, do indoor residue spraying for the entire district. And uh, and for where we have, uh, we have uh, some sub-counties uh, uh, as having a high transmission, we shall do a uh, targeted indoor residue spraying. Then level source management, we want to train field teams on level source management, map level habitats, uh, do deployment of, uh, of larviciding. And uh, here still, uh, we, for where we have, um, where we have a high transmission, you'll find that uh, we are actually, uh, Going to be doing uh, uh going to be doing the entire district, but in some areas we may have to do targeted, and then we want to also do de uh, distribute long lasting insecticide treated mosquito nets. Uh, this year we are doing our our fourth campaign, um, um and uh, wave one will include seventeen districts, but next week we are starting with two districts. That's uh, Bujiri and in Toroko. You also they launch this Tuesday. And uh, uh, we hope by December we would have reached every part of the country. And uh, at the end of the day, we must, uh, we must achieve uh, universal coverage where every household should have a net between two people. And uh, that is what, uh, and then we continue with school net distribution and uh, antenatal care distribution. 
and uh, distribution via the, 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 the UNEPI clinics. And of course, we also will be promoting social marketing, but also for indoor warriors just spraying. Um, there are private service providers for indoor warriors just spraying. We expect people in the urban setting to actually benefit from this. And, uh, but also we do spray schools and, uh, and prisons, basically institutions. Uh, school, uh, kindly let's see the next slide. Next slide. So, you know, um, we are emphasizing school here because clearly the literature coming through is indicating that the malaria burden is getting worse in the age group of above five to about 19 years of age and worse in the age group of five to nine. So, um, and uh, the risk here is that uh, for where you're having low transmission in Kampala, actually these people are dying a lot. And due to unique complications like black water fever, acute kidney injury, respiratory distress, they are dying a lot. But in the moderate to high transmission, what is happening when these school going children are having a lot of parasites? Some of them are asymptomatic and they contribute to a sustained malaria transmission. So, um, so we want to uh, focus on school as a, as, a, as, a, as a unit. So we want to establish and integrate the school malaria alert management system into the district mainstream alert management system. The districts already have an alert management system. So we want to integrate the school one in there. We want to establish and strengthen the use of a tailored school health kit that has ACTs, rapid diagnostic tests for malaria to enable early diagnosis and treatment. Uh, because you know we don't want these children to continue transmitting but also progress to severe malaria. We want to build the capacity of school resource focal persons in malaria surveillance, prompt referral and reporting. We also want to support the district wide strategic plans for last mile delivery of the following mal mass malaria chemoprophylaxis within the school communities. Actually, when we come out to do the malaria mass drug administration, what will happen is that we shall have a day when we are basically just dealing with school children. Then the subsequent uh, days, we go into communities. Then, of course, uh, this will be further strengthened by providing nets and where possible for boarding schools, we do, we do indoor warriors just spraying. Of course, we shall also map the, la, the habitats of lava and do lava source, uh, la, lava siding, but generally we shall also encourage the school teams to do lava source management. Then we want to establish and disseminate child and student friendly uh, malaria risk communication messages aimed at prevention suspicion and referral of malaria of malaria cases for treatment. Then we also want to conduct health promotion and capacity building on malaria prevention and control campaigns within schools in the affected districts. Then we want to support, coordinate and mobilize or mobilize school communities for blood donation campaigns and uh, that is aimed at equipping uh, regional blood banks in uh, the malaria epidemic districts with uh, adequate blood. Um, so basically this is our school package for this response. Uh, let's see the risk communication. I have about two slides or three to finish. Uh, let's look at the risk communication. Uh, so for risk communication, we basically would want to um, conduct, uh, to consult uh, different audiences um, um, and social listening to inform um, the to inform the interventions, um, and uh, we also want to review and update the available messages. We want to develop um, key messages to address uh, barriers uh, for effective behavior change. Uh, we also want to uh, to to um, we want to raise public awareness. We want to orient multi multi sector stakeholders uh, through advocacy to uh, to create an enabling environment. Uh, we also want to um, kindly. Uh, this is obstructing me. I don't know what it is. We want to continuously monitor and evaluate um, uh, evaluate our the strategy of, of risk communication to identify areas that require improvement, and uh, in collaboration with uh, with Siri, I think we want to conduct periodic surveys 
for evidence uh, based generation of uh, messages. And then we want uh, they want to deploy risk communication side staff, um, I think, at the district. Uh, really, communication, like the minister mentioned at some point, um, uh, they really want appropriate messages for a given moment in time. Um, then the next, the last one uh, is community engagement. Next slide. Community engagement. Okay, this is also very small. Uh, for coordination, they want to uh, reactivate uh, multi-sectoral task forces at uh, at uh, at all levels, including uh, the community engagement. Uh, subcommittees, village task forces, uh, committees, and then of course, parish task forces. Uh, so here they want to orient structures on their roles in the malaria IMS, select, um, I think this one here will be a duplication, but um, they want to make sure that the malaria focal person works well with, uh, with the community engagement uh, and the social protection pillar focal person. They want to develop village response plans uh, we, they want to facilitate village task forces to map out high risk homes um, and their support structures and develop parish, a parish directory. They want to mentor risk homes into prevention and management practices. They want to facilitate supervisors to employ a tailored mentorship to communities. The next thing they want to do is to support community led um, a contextualized context contextualized uh, interventions for reduction of mosquito population. So they want to conduct parish, uh, monthly parish community action days. This is what I was talking about in the beginning, engaging community in the education of potential mosquito breeding sites and uh, trying to clear them. They want to support sub-counties with uh, um, unresponsive communities to develop ordinances in line with public health, with the Public Health Act. Uh, well, um, these are long term, but later I will mention that uh, we in here we have some that are immediate actions and long term. And then lastly, the last slide, they want to uh, support village task forces and organized communities uh, to conduct parish based engagement to create ownership and and uh, and uh, practice uh, use of LLINs. They want to conduct door to door visit of households to reinforce use of LLINs, I think through hang up. They want to work with organized communities to put in place measures that will encourage the use of LLINs. They want to engage private sector CSOs and community health programs to monitor household use of LLINs. They also want to contextualize linkage and follow up pathways for test treat and management, both in the private and public sector. So they want to develop a, a context, uh, contextualized referral pathway and root charts to enhance community facility linkage for care. They want to establish and disseminate directories for community uh to facility support uh to facilitate uh, uh linkage they also want to establish triage in organized communities and lastly um in an attempt to adapt scale up the house the home-based care model for the management of new recovering malaria cases um uh, that will make it um uh, they want they want to make it a mandate of for all families and communities to support treatment adherence or treatment compliance for lack of a better word, to put in place practices that uh, break the chain of transmission at household level uh, by supporting and monitoring the patient uh, to complete their treatments, supporting um, household infection prevention. In other words, uh, they want uh, people in the household to uh, know that if we had a malaria patient, uh, any one of us can potentially get malaria. So if anyone gets sick, they take them to hospital uh, quickly. Uh, so they want to uh, facilitate the adaptation of uh, standard operating procedures for home-based care for malaria cases, uh, risk populations and recovering patients. They want to build capacity to service providers, both at public and private, uh, scale up home-based care, the home-based care approach for malaria management, but also build capacity for households to adopt the home-based care approach. Well, um, this is what they want to do. Uh, lastly, um, 
how do we want to approach this entire response? We shall have uh, immediate, intermediate, and long-term uh, interventions. Under the in immediate uh, interventions, we want to do malaria mass drug administration. We want to do malaria case management that is at the health facility, uh, community level and private sector. We want to make sure emergency medical services are functional and referrals are happening. We want to do indoor residue spraying. We want to continue doing surveillance and we want to do risk and uh, risk and behavior change communication. And here the intended outcome is uh, we want to reduce mortality immediately and we want to, uh, to reduce infection and morbidity. Uh, and then having reduced those, then in the intermediate, we want to continue with case management. We want to provide and make sure people are using LLINs. We want to do level source management. We want to continue doing risk and behavior change communication. We want to do surveillance. And by doing this, we want to reduce transmission. We want to sustain mortality reduction, but also sustain infection and morbidity control. Then in the long term, having achieved that, we want to continue with case management. We want to continue make, uh, uh, to make sure that people have adequate mosquito nets and they are using. And then uh, we want to also be very sure that um, uh, surveillance um, uh, is happening and risk, uh, risk, uh, risk and behavior communication change. Because having uh, achieved all this mortality reduction, infection and morbidity reduction, and further reduced it, we want to make sure that we hold the ground and sustain gains uh, so that we keep in the pre, uh, uh, pre epidemic level and probably move towards pre elimination. Um, for God and my country, thank you so much. I'm really sorry for. Uh, the long presentation. Questions are welcome. Thank you. Wow. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Jen, for such a 